Welcome to Deposition Processes for Microsystems, Part 1, presented by the Southwest Center for Microsystems Education. In this presentation, we're going to provide you with a, br a brief overview of deposition in general, and then we're going to talk about spin-on deposition and thermal oxidation. Microsystems, or MEMS, which as you know are microelectromechanical systems, are constructed using many of the same processes found in the manufacture of integrated circuits. Processes such as photolithography, wet and dry etch, oxidation, diffusion, planarization, and deposition. This is advantageous for many reasons. Um, one being that the equipment used to build computer chips already exist and that same equipment can be used to build microsystems. Because we're using the same equipment and processes, the electronics for the mechanical component of the MEMS device can be built simultaneously with the component itself on the same chip. An example of this is this vibrating gyroscope developed by Sandia, Sandia National Labs. Here you have the mechanical components that cause the gyroscope's proof masses to vibrate. Underneath the proof masses are capacitive sensing, sensing fingers that sense this vibration. When the device that the gyroscope is mounted to starts to tilt or rotate, the proof masses are forced in a different direction. They want to move in a different direction. This creates a differential capacitance in the electronics below the masses. This capacitance is picked up by the output electronics and the appropriate correction is then initiated. So where are these devices used? These devices are used in cameras and camera lenses for stabilization and what that does is it minimizes a blurry outcome whenever you take a picture and if you're like me you can't hold the camera very still. But let's talk about deposition in general for a moment. Deposition is any process that deposits a thin film of material onto an object. That object could be your sunglasses, faucets, door handles, or even the utensils that you eat with. In microsystem, that object could be a substrate, such as silicon or glass, or another thin film on a substrate. Here you see a silicon wafer, which is the substrate with a layer of silicon dioxide. The silicon dioxide could be used as an insulating layer or a sacrificial layer. Sacrificial layer being a layer of film that is used as a spacer and then removed at the end of the process. In this graphic you see several different thin film layers. You have your substrate, then you have conductive, um, conductive layers in both gold and red, and then you have your structural layer which forms this cantilever. What you don't see is the sacrificial layer that was deposited between this gold, this gold conductive layer and the blue structural layer. At the end of the process, that sacrificial layer was removed and that now allows this cantilever to move up and down. Deposition is a critical step in the making of microsystem because it deposits the films that we use for structures, for conductors and insulators, and to provide vertical vertical placements of structures and between structures. Once a film is deposited, it is usually patterned using photolithography, then etched using a wet or dry etch process. So where are thin films needed in microsystems? Well, for the structural and electronic components of the electronic switch that we just talked about, and also for mechanical components such as this micro-sized pressure sensor. In this picture, a thin silicon nitride film is being used for the diaphragm of the micropressure sensor. Small changes in pressure above and below the diaphragm cause this diaphragm to move up and down. This movement is detected by this gold sensing circuit that was fabricated on top of the silicon nitride layer from a previously deposited layer of gold. In microsystems, a very important application of thin films is the structural layer. Here we see an array of micro cantilevers. Depending upon the process, these cantilevers can be fabricated from the bulk of the silicon or they can be fabricated from a structural layer such as polysilicon that has been deposited upon, on top of a sacrificial layer of silicon dioxide. 
Thin films are also used for sensor coatings. These cantilevers that you see here are each coated with a chemically reactive thin film that targets a specific molecule, such as a virus or a bacterium. So just looking at this micro-sized device, you can see that we have at least four layers. A structural layer for the cantilever, an insulating layer of silicon nitride, a chemical non-reactive layer of gold, then a chemically reactive layer that is used for the probe. This layer, the probe layer, is the layer that actually identifies and latches onto the specific molecule, such as the virus or the bacterium. Because thin films have different thicknesses and compositions depending upon the applications, different deposition processes are required. Spin-on deposition is when the liquid is literally spun on to the surface of the substrate. Thermal oxidation is a process that grows a layer of silicon dioxide or oxide into a silicon surface. Chemical vapor deposition, or CVD, is a generic term for a series of processes that use chemical reactions to form a specific film of a specific thickness. Physical vapor deposition, or PVD, is used to deposit metals or metal alloys by vaporizing a metal, which then condenses on the surface, forming a thin film layer of metal. Electrodeposition, also known as electroplating, uses electrical current to coat an electrically conductive object with a relatively thin layer of metal or to fill a micro-sized cavity with metal. In part one of deposition processes, we will cover spin-on depositions and thermal oxidation. In part two, we cover CVD, PVD, and electrodeposition. So let's take a look at spin-on and oxidation. With spin-on deposition, a liquid is literally spun on to the surface of a wafer. The thickness of the film is controlled by the viscosity of the liquid as well as the spin speed. Spin-on deposition is used primarily for photoresist, which is a photosensitive thin film used in the photolithography process. Spin-on deposition is also used for spin-on glass, or SOG, which can function as a dielectric, a protective layer, or a planarization layer, which is basically a layer that creates a smooth surface once the surface becomes bumpy due to several layers of processing. Thermal oxidation is a process that is used specifically for silicon dioxide on a silicon substrate. Even though it's called a deposition process, Thermal oxidation actually grows silicon dioxide, or oxide, on a silicon substrate, very much like rust or iron oxide grows on iron. During thermal oxidation, molecules combine with the silicon molecules to form silicon dioxide. Initially, this reaction is on the surface of the substrate. However, as the oxide grows on the surface, oxygen molecules continue to penetrate the surface to reach the silicon on the substrate below. More silicon dioxide molecules are formed and the surface of the substrate begins to rise. By the end of the process, 55% of the final layer of the silicon dioxide is above the original surface of the silicon substrate, while the remaining 45% of, of the oxide is within the original substrate as shown here in this graphic. The process of thermal oxidation is relatively simple. It uses heat and an oxygen source. The silicon wafers are loaded into a process chamber. The chamber pressure is lowered and the temperature of the chamber is increased to a process set point. An oxygen source is then introduced into the chamber. This source could be pure oxygen gas or it could be water vapor. Which one is used determines how fast the oxide grows, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. As oxygen is, is pumped into the heated chamber, the oxygen molecules react with the silicon atoms, forming silicon dioxide. The temperature of the chamber, the oxygen source, and the process time determine how fast the oxide grows and how thick the final film layer will actually be. As I mentioned in the previous slide, the oxygen source can be oxygen gas or water vapor. If oxygen gas is used, it is called a dry oxidation process. 
If water vapor is used, it's called wet oxidation. The source of the oxygen has an effect on the oxidation rate or the rate at which oxide grows. Here we have a couple of logarithmic graphs that shows these relationships. Each color line is a different temperature. For instance, the blue line is 1200 degrees C and the purple line is 920 degrees C. Pause this presentation for a moment and answer the following question. How much oxide is grown in one hour at a temperature of 1200 degrees C in both a dry and wet process? All right, so let's see if you got it right. Okay, at one hour of time, at 1200 degrees C, which is the blue line, you should have been able to come up with approximately 0.2 microns of oxide thickness. In the wet oxidation process, at one hour, at 1200 degrees C, you should have found that your oxide growth is going to be approximately 0.85 microns or even 0.9 microns. So now if a device calls for an oxide thickness of let's say one micrometers, which process would you use, wet or dry? Pause the presentation for a moment and think about that. If you said wet, then you are correct. It would take a little over an hour looking at the wet process for it to reach one microns. But now if we come over here to the dry oxidation process, we see that even after 10 hours, we still haven't reached one micrometers of oxide. So therefore, wet oxidation is used in the manufacturing of microsystems to grow the thicker layers into the micrometers at a faster rate than is even possible for dry oxidation. Dry oxidation is used for thin layers in the nanometers. Dry oxidation also allows for better control over the growth of thin oxides because the oxidation rate is slower. In part one of deposition processes, we covered the basics of spin-on deposition and thermal oxidation. Spin-on deposition is used for photoresist applications as well as spin-on glass. Thermal oxidation is used to grow a silicon dioxide layer. For information on additional deposition processes, be sure to view part two of deposition processes for microsystems. For more detailed information on all of these deposition processes, download the Deposition Overview Learning Module from the SCME website under Educational Materials. Thank you for viewing this presentation produced by the Southwest Center for Microsystems Education.